Thanks. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to My AHR Live. I guess you'd call this the lockdown special. Um, it's great to be here and connect. I kind of wish I could see you after four and a bit weeks of lockdown. Um, today, a little bit different. It's not quite as high tech as normal. Um, we're running it off an iPhone. There won't be the normal graphics and things. Different location, obviously. And my assistant behind the camera, in case you're concerned about any bubbles being burst, is my son, Isaac. So thank you, Isaac, for helping out today. Um, he's making sure the camera connects and making sure we keep an eye on questions and things as they come in. Um, again, thank you for joining. Our normal uh, MyHR Live sort of rules apply, and that is that this is an open Q&A. We look forward to hearing from you and answering your questions where we can. If we run out of time today, and we will come back and answer them on the Facebook chat. Um, if you're not uh, watching this live, obviously we do record it, so you can tell um, people who can't make today's session that they can see it on our uh, our own website, myhr.co.nz, um, the Facebook page, the LinkedIn page, the YouTube channel. So it will be there. Um, now, before I kick off, I think it's important to say, as anyone who's doing any kind of public address at the moment, is there's a, one thing I'd like to say is uh, thank you to all of our essential workers, all the people who have been working and keeping things ticking over during this time. Um, as, as many of us have been locked at home either working or many have been at home and not working. So thank you to those. I'd also like to do a shout out to our business owners. Um, this is a tough time and there are many businesses and business owners and managers out there who are struggling, trying to figure out what the future of work might look like, what the impact on their business will be, and if even, in fact, they will have a business. Um, the wage subsidy has bought us all some time, um, but it is no doubt an incredibly stressful time for everybody. Um, and so I think as a business community, it's incumbent on all of us to band together and work together to support each other. So in terms of today's session and today's topics, it's all, of course, COVID related. Um, what I would like to do, because this is such a massive and somewhat tricky and emotional topic, is just set some ground rules around what we're focusing on. We're focusing on my area of expertise, which is employment law and employee engagement and the connection between employees and, and their employers. Um, I'm not here to speculate about um, potential economic impacts, about the virus itself. I'm not a doctor, nor would I pretend to be. We are bombarded by experts and uh, pseudo-experts at the moment. So let's put all that to one side and talk really openly and honestly about what we can do in this situation in relation to employment law. Um, so kicking into it, the first thing is just a sort of high level address. And I think we all understand this. It's been fairly well signaled by the government, but it's quite important to remind, I think, everybody that firstly, um, normal employment law applies. So there is this overarching kind of umbrella of legislation that existed pre-COVID that will exist post-COVID, but it still exists during COVID. Um, and it's really important to remember that. These are rules and, and laws around our good faith obligations, around the way we consult and the consultation we must do, around the terms of the employment agreement and how we make changes to those terms. Um, so we always come back to the core principles of New Zealand employment law. From there, what I like to sort of then split out is two types of change that we are seeing. Um, one is permanent change to terms of employment and one is temporary change that is directly related to the impact of this COVID um, situation and the lockdown restrictions the government has placed on the country. So quickly I'll, I'll address permanent change because permanent change is actually relatively um, straightforward in that it is just the same. So permanent changes to employment under COVID are no different to permanent changes outside of COVID. And that means normal consultation rules apply. So if you are proposing to reduce your uh, team by a certain number of jobs, and that may result in a number of redundancies and a number of redeployments, normal redundancy consultation rules apply because the changes that you are um, placing on your business are permanent and ongoing. They live beyond the COVID crisis. And um, if you're proposing to permanently reduce people's hours of work or permanently proposing to reduce rates of pay, um, provided you don't reduce them below the minimum wage, of course, um, you must consult as you normally would because these are changes that will affect people on an ongoing basis. So claims around disadvantage, around unfair dismissal or constructive dismissal can still be raised. There's no sort of fast track option because of the COVID crisis. So that's, that's the category of permanent change. There's a lot of resource out there. I mean, check out our, our site. Or, um, there's plenty of stuff around restructures and those sorts of things. So there's no sort of, um, I guess, shortcut or free kick because of COVID and our government's been really clear on that. 
So let's then focus on temporary change that relates specifically to COVID because this is a little bit different. Um, and I'm drawing information from the many government websites. There's business.gov.nz, there's employment.gov.nz, uh, there's the COVID-19 site, um, there's the IRD, uh, MSD, or work and income, sorry, have information as well. So we're doing our best to collate and pull all the information that we are getting. Um, employment.gov has, has said that consultation timeframes um, in relation to temporary changes under COVID can be shortened than they might normally be because of the, the special circumstances. And so what we, are, what we are seeing is where temporary changes are being made to fit in with either the lockdown restrict, restrictions or the uh, 12 weeks of the wage subsidy and potential impact on a business over that time, consultation is shorter. It's typically happening over a 24 hour period um, and it's focused on getting the business through the COVID crisis and keeping people employed through that crisis, which is the stated aim of the government with the wage subsidy. So when you're introducing temporary changes, it might be a reduction from 40 hours a week to 32 hours a week, and it's for the, the four weeks of lockdown or the, the 12 weeks of subsidy. Um, consultation is a condensed process. But it's very important that you state that it's a temporary change. This is not a, uh, an opportunity for the employer to permanently disadvantage or change an employee's terms of employment. So the temporary change category is a little bit different. So those, those sort of headlines are quite important when you enter into this um, because then how you go about tackling it and the way you consult with staff um, will have an impact on, uh, on the meetings you need to have or the letters that you need to issue. Um, what I will say sort of above all of this is communication remains key. If you've seen our, our MyHR lives in the past, this is something I always talk about, you know, connecting to your people, talking to your people, being transparent, um, outlining what this all means for us. You know, we've lost... X amount of revenue because our customers are all closed or we're not allowed to open and trade. It might be we've lost 100% of revenue. Um, but transparency and communication at any time is important. I think right now even more so. Um, and that will uh, help people connect with any decisions that you need to make. Um, going in then to this sort of next phase, I guess the survival of, um, of businesses, focusing on us bouncing back, on coming through um, the, the lockdown period on moving from level four, which we've got for another week, and into level three, uh, where some businesses can open again. I think I read yesterday that um, 500,000 Kiwi employees will be able to go back to work under level three. Um, so that's, a, that's a, another jump up. Um, there's still quite a few who will remain off work, but nevertheless, um, many industries will open. Uh, there will be some guidelines and rules around how they will open, but now's the time to start focusing on recovery and bounce back. And I'd like to cover some areas around this, some um, uh, frequently asked questions that we're seeing, um, and I guess some tips and things as well. Um, the first thing that came out yesterday, you might have uh, picked up in the Prime Minister's announcement that employers are allowed to go back to work this week to prepare for trading under level three. So going back to work this week is only to prepare. That might be to receive stock or get the workplace ready, clean the environment, whatever it may be. Um, it's clearly not to trade, but it is to attend. That's a slight um, stretch in the rules under level four and the previous kind of lockdown, the rigidity of the lockdown. So you can have people back at work if you intend to be trading under level three. Couple of tips I just want to keep you aware of. You, you may be aware, but just don't forget in these times because all the days sort of blur into one. Um, Saturday, of course, is the Anzac Day public holiday, and Monday is the Anzac Day um, observed public holiday for Monday to Friday workers. That's the Mondayized um, public holiday. So if you are bringing workers in to help you prep for work under level three, if they work on the Saturday or the Monday, uh, they will be entitled to payment at time and a half. So just be aware of that, that, that law that if you work on a public holiday, you get time and a half continues to apply. In addition, if the day they work was otherwise a working day, they will of course receive a full alternative holiday. That's the, the old day in lieu, they'll get this extra day off. So um, if you're concerned about cash flow, if you're concerned about meeting a time and a half wage obligation, um, you might do your prep um, between sort of today and Friday or on Sunday, ready to open on, on the Tuesday. So don't forget that the public holidays um, are in there and anybody who works on those days will be entitled to time and a half on one or the other. Um, again, normal uh, rules and laws apply and they don't get to double dip there. So preparation or preparing the workforce um, is, is going to be important, I think, for a lot of businesses, whether that's receiving stock, um, unpacking, getting ready for, for pick-pack duties, whether that's starting up machinery, 
um, that needs to be warmed up, whether it's prepping food in a kitchen if you are a cafe or a restaurant that is going to be able to provide people food through home delivery um, or uh, a, a non-contact um, exchange out on the, on the shop front on a, on a bench or something like that. Um, so the great news is that that is allowed. Regarding rostering for next week, um, obviously now is the time to put rosters out or to notify your team that they need to be coming in next week and the hours that they're going to need to work. Um, once again, going back to our principles around the, the permanency of change versus temporary changes, if you put a roster in place and let's say you come back next week and you're two days into the level three and it's uh, a lot busier or a lot quieter than you anticipated, normal roster change rules would apply. Um, what I'm suggesting and what we are suggesting to clients is um, when you produce the sort of level three lockdown roster, um, allow yourself and consult with your employees about the provision for perhaps a little more flexibility than you otherwise would, would have. Because you may need to make decisions on the fly, you may need to react quickly to it being busier or quieter than you otherwise expected. Um, and again, this is not an attempt to undermine normal rights, to uh, erode rights around roster consultation or changes to rosters. Um, it's an acknowledgement of the unique circumstances. When COVID passes, we go back to the normal roster notification rules. So getting, uh, getting your business set up and ready to trade is, is important. If you, are not, uh, if you do not have to sorry, attend work, um, then you don't under Level 3. I think we're aware of that. The, the wording is quite clear. It's if you can, you should versus the wording under level two, which was um, if, you, if, if you can, you should, versus if you should, you should, or something like that, right? So under level two, you have the option to determine whether or not you work at, at the office or not. Under level three, you don't. If you can work from home, you are being asked to do so. It's the same obligation they've placed on our um, kids who go to school, saying that if you can learn from home, you should learn from home. Um, school is open only for those children who need to because their parents are now required to attend work. Um, so for those of you who are home office based and who have set up a home office like us, um, that continues. Level four is not massively different for you in terms of working practice. Um, some tips in and around working practice, some things that we've found work really well. Um, we've established uh, obviously daily connects with all of our team over Zoom. We meet, we meet face to face. Uh, we had Friday drinks on, on Friday. I'm seeing a lot of businesses doing this stuff. It's really important. Don't forget the connection, the social connection. Um, if you can, I am recommending you retain your uh, EAP or counselling services if you have them already in place in your businesses, if you can still afford to do so. It's incredibly important. Uh, as a business owner who's struggling, I'd encourage you to take up some of those services as well. Um, talk to somebody outside your bubble. Pick up the phone and have a chat to a professional if you're struggling. Um, it's an incredibly important thing to do at a tough time. Um, for all of the workers and all of the businesses whose workers are at home and only receiving the wage subsidy, um, and who now cannot work still under level three, um, life also carries on in much the same way. Um, you may see some changes in your day to day in that you might be able to go up the road and pick up a coffee or order a, a pizza to be delivered, um, but your working life remains sort of on lockdown as we wait for the restrictions to, uh, to move further. And the wage subsidy uh, should cover that. So that's the stuff kind of around prep. I won't go through and list obviously all the industries that are unlocking, that's, that's been pretty clearly defined by the government. If you're unsure about whether you can or cannot open, um, by all means reach out, but I would advise you to probably um, you know, seek some advice from within the government around that. I think most of you know which category you fall in. Um, and then if you are opening and you are trading or you are doing uh, some work, then obviously there are a range of health and safety uh, measures that you have to take. Um, so that is the sort of summary in terms of uh, where we are going under level three, what, what we're seeing, broad principles around change and those sorts of things. What I would like to do now is dive into, um, I've got three frequently asked questions. These three questions we are finding are coming up um, the most often under this lockdown and subsidy um, environment. So I'd like to address those three. They may address some of the questions that are coming in on the, um, on the Facebook channel. But once I've done these three, we'll then turn to the screen and have a look and answer some of your questions live as well. Um, so the first one relates to public holidays. How are they treated under this lockdown um, time? Do we, uh, what rates do we pay? Are they in fact even recognised? So um, the, the first and simple answer is yes, they are still recognised. Public holidays still continue to apply. Um, and to those of you that know and understand public holidays, 
um, a couple of the sort of headline criteria that you need to always be thinking about are determining whether a person should be paid for the public holiday, and that is based on whether or not the day is otherwise a working day, and then what you pay them for the public holiday, which is based mostly on relevant daily pay, and that is defined as what they would have earned had they worked. If you cannot accurately determine relevant daily pay because of a, of a highly variable roster, you can use the uh, um, average daily pay calculation. An average daily pay is an average of your days worked over the last year um, in terms of the, uh, the total earnings for those days divided by the number of days will give you your average daily amount. Just to be clear, and you will have seen me talk about this in previous discussions around the Holidays Act, Public holiday payment is not in uh, a greater of or lesser of in the same way annual leave is. It is relevant daily pay first. That's the go-to. And you only use average daily pay if you cannot accurately determine the, uh, the, relevant, daily pay, uh, the, the relevant daily pay number. So first thing is, is it otherwise a working day? Um, and, and it's, again, the, uh, the MB website is really, really clear that the determination around an otherwise working day is based on your pre-COVID work pattern, right? So prior to the lockdown, let's just pick an easy one. Let's say you are a Monday to Friday full-time worker. Uh, you are therefore entitled to recognition of the public holiday for Good Friday and Easter Monday and Anzac Day Monday, because those would have been otherwise working days for you. So that's a, a sort of a tick to the, uh, the recognition of the public holiday. Now we look at how, are they, how does that work out? Like how are they paid? How are these people recognized for that? Um, first one is easy. If you are an essential service and people are working as normal, so you've done your 40 hours um, in the week or you've done, say, in the, in the Good Friday day, you've worked 32 hours Monday to Thursday and you've had Friday off, you get your 40 hours pay like normal. Um, 32 are worked hours, eight hours is recognition for the public holiday. If that same worker was to work the full 40 hours, they would receive 32 hours at normal time, they would receive Good Friday eight hours at time and a half, and they would have a whole day in lieu or alternative holiday um, put into their, uh, into their leave accrual system and payroll. Then there's a category of worker who is not working at all and who is at home and only receiving the wage subsidy. Um, the other thing that the, uh, the MB website, employment.gov.nz, has been really clear on is that the wage subsidy can be used to pay for public holidays, right? So in a week where the person is not working, and let's say they're, they're, they qualify for the full-time subsidy, so 585.80, uh, they receive 585.80 for that week. And in that week, the portion of um, 585.80 that would cover then their uh, normal public holiday entitlement is included in that subsidy. You don't pay the subsidy and the public holiday pay on top of that. Um, so those two groups are uh, pretty easy. The, the middle group where it's a little trickier is you've agreed a temporary reduction in hours for the, um, for the period of the public, uh, sorry, of the lockdown. So let's say that same Monday to Friday worker, you've agreed for the purpose of lockdown because there is a diminished workload, um, instead of them working 40 hours a week, uh, they're going to work 20 hours a week from home. So uh, the first thing you need to do is we, we tick the box that otherwise uh, the Friday is an otherwise working day. Um, so that is they get recognition for the Good Friday public holiday. But the payment of relevant daily pay, and let me be clear about this, I'm really keen to hear people um, with other views. We've based this on our interpretation of the Holidays Act. We've based this on the fact there is no direct reference to this on the government websites. And we have spoken to um, other professionals in our industry, other lawyers, and we have read other um, law-related blogs relating to this. And that is the payment of relevant daily pay is based on the new temporarily reduced hours. Because the definition is, what you would have earned had you worked. And if you would have worked, and it would have been a four hour day on your, on your temporary reduced hours under COVID, that is what you get paid as part of your public holiday entitlement for that week. So um, otherwise working day is pre-COVID, relevant daily pay is within that COVID period. So that's the public holiday question. The second one, um, which is uh, also a little tricky, and I, you know, we don't mind sort of diving into the tricky ones, is what happens if I make somebody redundant during the period that I have received the subsidy? Um, so there is some clear advice from the government around this. If you receive the subsidy prior to 4 p.m. on the 27th of March, 
um, you are required to undertake a best endeavours approach to things. You, you should not have applied for the subsidy with the intention of making somebody redundant in the hope you could collect and keep the money. Um, you're, you should undertake on best endeavours to keep those people employed. For people who applied after 4pm on the 27th of March, the MSD website or the, the forms and things is pretty clear. One of the, one of the rules or one of the terms are you cannot make people redundant. Um, if you have absolutely no choice, you've entered into the, uh, the process in good faith, you've applied for the wage, wage subsidy with the full intention of keeping everybody employed, you've collected the wage subsidy and you've suffered another catastrophic loss or the extension of, of level three or the, the introduction of level three has caused you issues and you now need to consider redundancy, you're advised that you need to notify MSD if you have made somebody redundant uh, for whom you collect the subsidy. And MSD will take that from there. I'm not, they may ask for the money to be refunded. I'm not sure. We haven't heard of anyone being asked for refunds, but um, you're obliged to notify MSD that you've collected subsidy for a person and that person no longer works for you due to redundancy. Um, so that, that's the requirement around that. What we're getting, and let's sort of take the, uh, the legal stuff and put it to one side and focus, focus on the reality. We are finding that there are businesses and employees out there who have hit this situation. And so they engage in good faith around a restructure discussion and the employee, probably rightly so, says, well, hang on a minute, how about you don't make me redundant? Just keep me on for 12 weeks and pay the subsidy and then at the end of it, you can make me redundant because otherwise I'm unemployed and, uh, and I've got no hope of getting a job right now because everybody is shut. And you can appreciate that that's a pretty valid question from an employee, right? You're staring down the barrel of unemployment and maybe the, um, you know, the job seeker's allowance um, or some other um, wins benefit, or the prospect of continuing to receive 585.80 per week. Um, so these questions are coming up. I'm not sure they've been adequately addressed by the government, I've got to be honest, but um, they will arise if you try to commence a redundancy with your people during the subsidy period. That's been our observation. Um, we have heard of, uh, and we're, we're certainly not advising, we're advising people to stick to the guidelines of the government, but we have heard of instances where employers are in consultation with employees agreeing that the uh, subsidy period will form the notice period um, and they will pay the subsidy to the end of the notice period uh, and the payments will include payment for notice. Um, annual leave still must be paid out anyway. That is, you, you can't avoid that obligation. And at the end of the subsidy, the, redund the redundancy will be confirmed and the employee will leave. And as they haven't left in the subsidy uh, window, um, they, there's no obligation to notify MSD. Now, that to me doesn't sound like you're keeping with the principles of the wage subsidy, um, but uh, that is some of the kind of um, workaround we're hearing out there. I'd be pretty keen to hear um, from Ian Lees Galloway or Grant Robertson about what they're going to do to help us um, keep people employed beyond the wage subsidy time, help businesses recover so we can get revenue in and we can start paying our people and we don't have to go through this redundancy. There's certainly been a, a staged or, a, or sorry, a delayed, uh, a delayed given to the redundancies in New Zealand because of the wage sub. So that's great. It's keeping Kiwis employed. We just need to make sure we can keep as many of them as possible employed post subsidy. The last of my uh, three big and tricky questions is uh, what if my people refuse to work under level three due to COVID concerns? So we're opening under level three, we can trade to some description and they're just saying they're not coming to work. Um, it's interesting, we're getting this question quite a bit now. And um, again, the simple answer is this reverts back to standard and normal um, non-COVID time employment law. So you absolutely have some obligations to your employees' health and safety. Those obligations are clearly defined by the Health and Safety at Work Act. And in addition now, under COVID, there are some additional regulations around um, rules you must in, uh, put in place in the workplace around social distancing, around uh, um, cleanliness and hand sanitization, those sorts of things. There's a range of PPE that is required in certain industries. Um, and those things are um, to be read in conjunction with the Health and Safety at Work Act. So your obligation as an employer is to keep your people safe. Um, if you are rostering somebody and they refuse to work for the simple reason that they don't want to, uh, they are either enjoying um, time off and receiving 585.80 without having to attend work, or they um, are just a little bit fearful of COVID, your obligation um, is to address their concerns directly. They have a good faith obligation to respond and say why. If their, if their response is genuine, so that I am living with an immune compromised person, I am immune compromised myself, um, I have an, a, a, an underlying health condition of some description, or I'm genuinely sick. I don't have COVID, but I've developed a 
flu or tummy bug or whatever it is. Um, you need to consider these things and in good faith if it's genuine you may put, they may be on sick leave or they may be entitled to receive the, uh, the leave payment which is part of the wage subsidy now. If the reason is not valid and if the reason is simply I just don't want to, um, then they are now in breach of their obligations to you as an employee, right? They're the same contractual obligations that bind you as an employer to look after your team in that way, bind the employee. You have made the roster available, you've presented a work opportunity, they are declining to work. Um, you can compel them to attend work and if they refuse to attend work, you do not need to pay them for the shift that they have not worked. That includes payment that would have come from the wage subsidy in this situation because they are declining to work. They may at that point be electing to resign and leave your employment. You may want to notify MSD that you have this money for them that they cannot collect because they're no longer working for you or they are refusing to work for you. You may be able to use that money to pay other workers who now have to cover their shift. So, you know, I, I'm, I don't mean to sound mean, um, but this is the reality. And there's an, a sort of baked in um, perceived unfairness here. If people are now having to go to work and work for their wage subsidy, while their mates at home or their flatmates or their, their, their uh, husband or wife um, are at home earning the same money and not being required to work. But that is part of the, us being in, in this together, right? There's no, um, th that level of um, perceived unfairness um, doesn't really stack up when you consider that you now have work. The people going back to work are in some of the best positions in the country because there is ongoing and continuous employment available here. And so refusal to work because you don't want to or because you'd rather just stay at home and collect the subsidy is not a valid reason to refuse work. So you may at that time roster somebody else to cover that shift and not pay the person who is in breach of their employment agreement by not attending work. Um, so unless we see an update from the government, this uh, guidance is valid as at now, as at, um, what are we, 2.30 on, um, on Tuesday the 21st of April. Um, if there's a change we will certainly update you. Um, but yeah, an outright refusal to work is no more acceptable now than it has been in the past. But please be aware of genuine safety concerns and be aware of heightened levels of anxiety right now. Again, I'm not trying to sound mean. Um, if people are really, really worried about coming into work, ask them to express those concerns, address those concerns, but provided you can demonstrate you are meeting all of your obligations under the Health and Safety at Work Act and all of the additional regulations laid on us by the government in response to this virus, um, then you can compel your people to attend work where you have work for them. So there you go, those are the three um, tricky and somewhat curly questions. I'm going to jump across to um, the questions online and see how many we've got. Um, we're at half an hour, which is normally um, roughly when we try to end, but let's just see what you've been saying and address them. Um, This question about the minimum wage. Oh dear, okay, we've got quite a lot of questions here. What I think we're going to be able to do is get through all of them. All of them. Let's start at the um, start. Anna um, raised the first question here in a book. I have a question for the session this afternoon. Could you have some general guidance on how to deal with employee relations issues during alert level three? Is it best to hold off any performance and disciplinary process and things to get back to normal? Yeah, this is a really good question. This is about disciplinary and performance issues um, under alert levels uh, four and three. Um, and what do we do? Um, and again, I know I keep saying it, but normal employment law applies here. But it depends, like in every disciplinary or performance or conduct situation, on what has happened and when it has happened. So let's say you have performance concerns with somebody who uh, was not meeting the requir requirements of their job pre-COVID. You were all set to sit them down for a performance discussion. The performance discussion may have had um, some formal consultation in relation to disciplinary outcomes and performance improvement plans. I would encourage you to have had that conversation already because it clearly relates to something pre-COVID and you were all sort of all ready to go on that. Um, waiting for six weeks till work, things come back to normal, by the time you kind of get set up again, um, it, it, you know, potentially two, three months have passed and you're now addressing an historic issue. So I think those things are worth, worth addressing. Um, performance concerns during COVID absolutely are um, acceptable, provided you've factored in the unique situation. 
you know, it's hardly fair to require um, a sales rep to exceed their targets by 120% when they can't actually connect with any of the prospects because the entire economy is shut down. You know, so unreasonable KPIs at this time will not be looked upon very favorably. But if somebody is working during this time and they are not fulfilling their obligations, you can um, and potentially should just add, you know, be compassionate. There are other factors going on here. And we always recommend this anyway. This is not necessarily a COVID thing, but probably more so right now. Um, just ask the question, are you okay? Is there a reason why you've dropped? You know, you used to be amazing at this job and you were, and now we're noticing some issues or mistakes and it's causing us problems and we, we have, um, you know, clients who are upset with us at a time when we can ill afford to upset any of our paying customers. Um, so address the issues head on. And if you need to, you can absolutely deal with the performance matter. But you must adjust your expectations reasonably to, to um, affect the COVID thing. Um, so I hope that um, answers the question. In terms of process, um, a follow-up there might be, well, therefore, can I have these meetings over Zoom or Skype or, or FaceTime or on the phone? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, so it is acceptable to do this consultation by emailing letters and by having the meetings. Um, allow extra time for people to seek representation because it may be harder for them. They can't go into a lawyer's office or, um, or go and you know, speak to people. Um, so they will need to Google and make phone calls and drop emails out to people who might be their representative. So allow a bit more time, but you can absolutely run these processes remotely. Okay, George. Protocols for business. Three company. All right, so this is about this is an industry that is returning to work. Um, and is there anything we need to be aware of as a level three, um, as somebody who can operate? They supply the forestry industry. Um, I mean, absolutely. I would immediately you want to reintroduce all of your existing health and safety protocols and then overlay the COVID stuff. So the Health and Safety at Work Act hasn't gone away. Um, so don't just look at the list of requirements under COVID regulations. Um, add those COVID regulations to your normal health and safety requirements. Um, practice appropriate social distancing. You kind of need to look across the workforce. You know, how is your uh, how's your staff cafeteria set up? What are the loos like when people have to go to the toilet? What's a, what's the setup of say locker rooms if you have uniforms or the toilet? Are so there work showers? Uh, where do people you know, um, get changed if they need to get changed? Or park their bikes if they ride into work? All of these sorts of things. I think it's a, it's a sort of top to bottom review of the workplace and it's making sure that there are adequate safety measures in place across the board. Um, this one, how do we respond to workers who simply do not want to work, citing uh, COVID-19 as their fear? I think we've addressed that, so there you go. That's, uh, that's one that's come up. Um, how are we going? It's, Let's say I'll do three, three more questions and then um, we'll answer the rest online. Um, meeting about the 2 p.m., wondering if we're able to make symptoms. Ah, yeah, this has come up a little bit actually. Good question, Susan. Um, thank you. Um, this is about compelling a person to be tested if they appear to be displaying symptoms of COVID and if you can in fact compel them um, and uh, whether that's fair or not or a breach of, of their human rights. Um, there's, I haven't seen, if someone has seen, I'm all up for collaboration, drop a message, but I haven't seen specific guidance in relation to this. And I think the reason being, um, there's probably adequate guidance already available under existing legislation. And that is if you believe that somebody is a risk to themselves or others, and that might be through having a contagious medical condition, you may under certain circumstances be able to compel them to attend the doctor. Um, you would need to pay for that. There are, of course, these free and voluntary um, clinics popping up all over the place. But if you had genuine reason to believe somebody was a risk to others in the workplace or a risk to themselves, and, and provided you had an employment agreement that allowed for this, and most good employment agreements do, you may compel somebody to undergo a test. You would need to pay for that. Um, and you would need to consult with them and, and, and share your reasons why. Um, Genuine reason would need to consider all of the factors. You know, what makes you think they have it? Have they come into contact with someone? Are you aware that they were part of one of these hubs of infection, Marist College or the, the Wedding and Bluff, whatever it may be? Or are you simply speculating? You know, and all of those normal rules apply. Um, our, our ability as an employer to dive into people's personal medical lives and medical history is understandably somewhat limited. But where you have genuine reason to believe that there is a risk to the safety of, of, of others in the workplace, um, you could request that they get a medical clearance, uh, provided you pay. Um, Andrew, paying stuff 80% minimal pay, Mr. Wigman, 100% hours. 
Oh, this is about reimbursement. So um, this question relates to the 80% uh, payment. So when the wage subsidy was first introduced, the government required, you might remember in the first week or the first couple of days when Grant Robertson, annou Grant Robertson announced it, um, it was capped at $150,000 and there was a requirement for employers to top up wages to 80% of earnings. Um, within a fairly short time after that was released, that was amended to being uncapped, so it went well above $150,000. And the obligation to top up wages to 80% was removed and, and employers were asked to try to top up wages to 80% but they no longer had to. Um, so it's a top up to 80% from the wage subsidy, not necessarily a wage reduction from 100%. And I know that sounds like I'm being a politician, Andrew, um, but it's the way you sort of think about the change. Now, there are two ways that we've seen employers go about if making this change. One has been a 20% reduction in hours. So if we have a normal worker, Monday to Friday, 40 hours a week, they go from a 40 hour week to a 32 hour week for COVID. And they work 32 hours or they're at home being paid for 32 hours. And that number includes the wage subsidy plus the employer top up to whatever makes 32 hours. Um, so their take home pay is 80% of their normal earnings. So they've, they've lost 20% of their weekly take home pay but it's on a pro rata basis, right? Their base salary remains the same, um, if that makes sense. So a person on $52,000 a year who earns $1,000 a week um, is now earning $800 a week because they are only working the 32 hours. In the case of Andrew here, the question that he's asked, um, they've done the other way, which other, some employers have done, and that is they have asked their staff to continue working 40 hours because there is enough work coming in, but they've asked them to take a temporary pay cut of 20%. So first thing is, provided that 20% pay cut does not drop you below the minimum wage, it is okay, provided you have consulted about that. And if the change is temporary, that the consultation rules are the sort of COVID ones I talked about earlier. If the change is permanent, that you have gone through a full consultation process and potentially allow them to consider a redundancy outcome if they do not want to um, have that level of, of reduction. So. If, let's assume I think what you're saying is it's a 20% reduction on a temporary basis to get through COVID. Um, you're now looking at your recovery time frame and you're asking me if you need to reimburse the 20%. Um, the answer is no, you're not compelled to unless you've made a commitment to. So the rules around these reductions of hours or, or salary that relate to COVID do not mention the, um, the payback at all. So you're not obliged by law to pay back the 20% that these people have not been paid over this week because you have reached mutual agreement to temporarily reduce hours for the duration of COVID. And mutual agreement, employees might go, well, hardly, I didn't really have a choice, but um, neither did the employer, right? None of us really have a choice at this point in time. The alternative was potentially redundancy, it was potentially, look, um, employers can't afford to pay, we're gonna have to lay some staff off. Thankfully, because of the wage subsidy, we don't have to lay people off, but we need to make some short-term cuts. And those short-term cuts include a wage reduction or an hours reduction or whatever it may be. So, um, Andrew, I do not uh, believe you need to pay back that 20% post-COVID. Um, if you can no longer um, sustain the 80% um, payment, um, and if there is a corresponding reduction in workload, you may go as far as having your people at home uh, and receiving the subsidy only. And they can work for as many hours as the subsidy covers, or they can be at home and not working at all and receive that subsidy amount. Um, which to remind you all is 585.80 for a full-time worker, or 350 for a part-time worker, or their normal weekly earnings um, if that number is less than those two amounts. And normal weekly earnings, um, if you go again to the WINS website, it very clearly says um, the first bullet point is uh, as stated in the employment agreement, uh, on or prior to the 26th of March or something like that. So it's what's written in the agreement. If the agreement is not clear, um, then there are options to look at average earnings over the last year. Uh, public holiday question, Andrew, we got that one. That's another Andrew. And now we have one, two, three, four, five more to go. And we're at 45 minutes. So I'm now conscious that post uh, production, this is a quite a long event. We're going to jump on and answer these questions online. Otherwise, I'm going to be here for another 45 minutes. But I hope this has addressed some of the big issues, the big sort of headline questions out there, and that I have tackled some of the direct ones you've raised. We're gonna jump on now and type some responses to this, my son and I. If you weren't here at the start, in case you're worried about bubble bursting, my helpful assistant behind the camera 
um, as we're in this alternative environment is my son Isaac, so thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. If you're watching after the event, um, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Check out our website, myhr.co.nz, lots of good resources and info there for you. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing everybody for a beer or a wine or a coffee when we're allowed out in the street again. Take care everybody, look after yourselves. See you later.